So, we are still in the Gospel of John. We're in John chapter 4 now. My name is Mr. Scott, and um, this is the Articulate chapter of the Gospel of John, and I, I'm having fun. Today, we're going to start a story that's going to take us two weeks to cover. We're not going to beat it to death like we did Nicodemus and spend four or five weeks on it. But we are going to spend two weeks on it because it's um, just because it's long. In my Bible, it's two whole pages. So let's start reading in John chapter 4, and we're going to read this today, verses 1 through 26. So there's three of us here. Um, Matt, if you'll kick us off and read, um, I guess, 1 through 6. And then Alyssa, if you'll read, tell you what, I'll, I'll read 1 through 6. Y'all get to read more. Then Matt, you can read 7 through 15. And Alyssa, uh, if you'll please read 16 through 26. Oh, I go first. Okay, John chapter 1. I, know, I don't usually start. I usually make somebody else start. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. He told her, Go, call your husband, and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on the mountain, but you Jews claimed that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is Spirit, and his worshipers must worship in Spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he. Very good. So this conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman follows on the heels in this gospel of what we studied last week, which was a conversation between John and his disciples. And I wanted to briefly touch base on that because, um, oops, I got my eraser out. Let's see, we've, John's disciples were in a, a heated discussion with a Jew who was very likely a, now a disciple of Jesus over purification. And likely they were talking about baptism. It's the context of that entire section in John chapter 3. And their big complaint when they when they get done with that talk, they come and talk to, to John the Baptist and they start whining to him. And their big complaint there is that Jesus is making more disciples than John. He is increasing in popularity, whereas John the Baptist is decreasing in popularity. 
And John corrects them and says, that's exactly how it's supposed to be, and here's why. Well, Jesus learns that this is becoming a known thing, that he is making more disciples than John the Baptist. And if the Pharisees and leaders of the Sanhedrin were upset with John about what he was doing, well, you can probably imagine that at this point they're going to start being upset with Jesus and what he is doing. So Jesus intentionally decides to leave the area. And I'm going to draw our map up here in the corner that we've drawn for several weeks. Here's our Sea of Galilee. Here's the Jordan River. And in the last few weeks, we've been down here in Jerusalem for the Passover and the conversation with Nicodemus. And then Jesus is going to leave and go back up here to the region of Galilee. In fact, I think he's going to go back to Cana um, in, in just a little bit. Well, in Cana, by the way, what happened in Cana? What was that first sign that Jesus did in, in Cana? Turning the water into wine. Turning the water into wine at a wedding. That I, I want us to remember that small context, that there, this sort of coming out of, of his purpose and of his role and the beginning of his ministry happened in a very small context at a wedding in Cana. We're going to see something just like that today. So here, to get from Jerusalem to Galilee, it's like a straight shot north. The problem is you've got to go through this area called Samaria. Samaria was originally just the capital city, and then eventually the whole region became known as Samaria. And the Jews, in general, uh, have no dealings with Samaritans. That's the way it's put in verse 9, uh, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Uh, but that's really a sort of an understatement. They hated their guts is probably the right way to put it. Uh, so there's some background there. The Samaritans were those who were left behind during the last exile. The invaders came into the country and captured the Jews, took them home to their native country, and left a few people in Samaria. Well, those who stayed behind in Samaria, their culture changed over time. They began to intermarry with some of the nations that surrounded them. They began to worship some of their, their false gods as a result, in addition to the one true God. And they, uh, their doctrine changed. In addition, they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, sort of like the Sadducees do. Um, and they, the biggest theological point of contention between the Jews and the Samaritans was, where do you worship? Do you worship at the temple in Jerusalem? Or do you worship in the temple on top of Mount Gerizim, which um, I have to draw a little bit of geography here. There were a, a series of mountain ranges here. Still are, by the way. They don't, they don't move very fast. Okay. And here's Sychar. That's where our story is going to take place today. Just outside of Sychar is a mountain, Mount Gerizim. I'll just write Mount G. And there's a temple on that mountain built by a king. And that's where the Samaritans would go and worship. And um, in, in the time of Jesus' day, the worship they did at the Temple on Mount Gerizim was the same worship that they did down in Jerusalem. They, they basically followed all the same practices. They pushed out the, the false worshiping, the worshiping of false gods. Um, but the Jews and the Samaritans still hated each other. And Jesus played on that, for example, in one of his parables that he tells. The, the um, parable of the good Samaritan, as you probably heard it where there was a man who was waylaid by robbers, left to be dead in a ditch, and multiple men walk by who were Jews of varying priestly classes, and they all ignore him. They just walk by, but a Samaritan comes to his aid. And he uses that as an example, knowing that the crowd would not have wanted the Samaritan to be the good guy in the story. So this is not the last time Jesus is going to intentionally do something with Samaritans to prove a point. So here he, he leaves Jerusalem and he could have traveled this way along the Jordan to get to Galilee around the mountain range. And he could have gone this way on the Western side, but he chose to take the short route. It, it, it knocked multiple days off the journey to go straight through Samaria up to Galilee. But it does mean you're going to have to interact with some Samaritans, likely. If you don't pack enough food, you're going to have to go buy food from Samaritans. And many Jews would not buy food that was cooked by a Samaritan. That I'm not going to eat with you. I'm not going to do business with you. I'm not going to talk to you. 
um, is sort of the attitude that they normally had. So here, this says in verse 4, he had to pass through Samaria. Had to. In the King James, it says must. He must needs pass through Samaria. Well, if you look at the map here, there's three different roads. But according to his purpose, what he intended to do in order to accomplish that, he had to pass through Samaria. And so he did. So he, he goes through uh, into Samaria. In verse 5, we'll pick up there. It says, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Now this guy named Jacob, do we remember who he is? Who is Jacob? Son of Isaac. He is the son of Isaac. And Isaac is the son of whom? Abraham. Abraham. Very good. These are our, these are our patri patriarchs of the Israelite nation. And Jacob was his original name. What did his name become? Israel. Israel. Alyssa, I see you muted over there. You, can, you don't have to make Matt answer all these. <laughs> That's, I'm, I'm also taking notes, so I'm like half a okay. second. <laughs> Not a problem. I'm just giving you a hard time. So this is that Jacob. Okay, this isn't just any Jacob. This is the Jacob who became Israel, and it's for his namesake that this entire nation is called. And he dug a well here, and it's interesting because it's it talks about him, this being his well here, and she's going to bring it up, the woman that Jesus meets in just a little bit. Are you greater than our father Jacob? And she talks about the work he did to build the well. This well, I read one account of this well. You know, when I... When I hear the word well, I think like a wishing well in somebody's garden like this, right? And it's made of stone and it's got a little house over it like this and you lower the bucket down inside or you throw pennies in and you make a wish. Um, unless you're Mr. Rogers. By the way, Mr. Rogers has a whole episode about wishes don't make things come true. I don't think anybody at Disney ever watched that episode. So there you go. This is going to be recorded and put on YouTube. But this is the picture that I think of when I think of well. But it's more like this. Um, there's one account that I read that said this well, um, at least when the commentary that I wrote uh, said that it was still there. There was a large stone that covered most of it like this. And then there was a hole, uh, like a way to get down under the stone. And it led to this like bigger chamber here. And then there was a really wide hole that was the actual well. And it was anywhere from 30 to 90 feet deep. I mean, like, it's kind of hard for them to, to, to measure it. But this is a really deep well. And the water's only down here in the last five feet. So you've got to have a really long rope. And, um, and you've got to get down here and do it. And Jesus comes over and he sits down beside the well. I'm going to show him sitting on the ground. But why is he sitting down? Why does the Bible say he sits down? What's the reason for that? It said that he was tired from the journey. He was tired. You know, it's easy for us to forget that Jesus was a real man. We, we read a lot about his signs and his miracles and his power, but Jesus is both fully God and fully man. He got tired. He got hungry. When they beat him, half to death, and then hung him on a cross, he suffered real pain. That's something that we should note as we go through, not just gloss over, oh, Jesus was wearied or he was tired. You know, it, he, his, his, his human body was not a superhuman body. His spirit was God. His body was the body of a man. Um, without any mixture there. So, you know, you're not going to see Jesus... Um, you know, walking up and, I mean, he did a lot of miracles, but there's sort of a sense in which we can kind of tell that these are true spiritual miracles that are performed each time, for example, that he heals somebody that's blind, he does it a different way every time, so that it's really obvious that there's not like a magic trick to what he's doing, it's the spirit performing the miracle. So here he's tired, he's sitting down, and now a new character comes into our story, and who is it? Who walks in? Who walks up to him? A woman from Samaria came to draw water. 
a woman from Samaria. And that's all we know about her at the moment. But we can already gather some data um, here. It says, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Let's rewind just one phrase there. When Jesus sat down by the well, it was about the sixth hour. Now, the Jews accounted time from sunrise, which was about 6 a.m., to sunset, which was about 6 p.m. Unlike what, how we measure time according to the Roman way of like midnight to noon, that's our hours. So if this is the sixth hour according to the Jewish clock, about what time would this be? About noon. About noon. Now, if you're in Israel, by the way, it's hot there. When's the hottest part of the day? Noon. It's probably about noon. Between noon and like three. I don't know. It, down here in Georgia, it gets hotter between noon and three, and then it really starts dropping off. But yeah, this is the hottest part of the day. She has come to draw water in the hottest part of the day. And it's just her. There's nobody else there. She's come alone. She's come to draw water alone in the hottest part of the day. Okay, so that's all we really know about her at the moment. And Jesus says to her something that blows her mind. He says, give me a drink. And she has an immediate reaction. She does sort of like that double take. Like she was planning on walking up to the well, letting down her bucket into this really deep well over here, and them not even speaking, because they don't normally speak, Jews and Samaritans. And Jesus turns to her and speaks to her, and not only does he, he doesn't just say hi, he actually asks for her to provide something for him. This, is, this isn't a, even a shallow interaction. This is, I'm thirsty and tired. We're out here in the hot sun. Can you give me a drink? And it, there's sort of an explanatory parenthetical statement here in verse 8. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Um, there's two things that, that we should take from that. Uh, one is the disciples are not there for this conversation. They've walked off. It's Jesus and a woman of Samaria. That's it. His disciples are gone. So all the things that he's going to say to her uh, until verse 26, because we don't see the disciples come back until verse 27, is just between the two of them. This is another example of one of those one-on-one -on -one conversations that Jesus has with people in the Gospel of John. A lot of the other, uh, the other three Gospels, a lot of those teaching passages are to groups, large groups, especially like the book of Matthew. You get the Sermon on the Mount, which was to a large group, and then he goes up even onto the, the Mount of Transfiguration, and he had, took at least three disciples with him there. So here it's just him and one other person. And the other thing to note here is they did go to buy food. So while a lot of Jews were very, you know, I'm not even going to do business with uh, Samaritans, Jesus' disciples, at least they've been instructed to, are going to be a little lax on that. And Jesus is going to take it a step further. Um, we're going to see a lot more interaction between Jesus and his disciples and the Samaritans next week um, when the woman goes to tell of her friends about what happened. So she says to him, how is it that you, in verse 9, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Now, one thing to note here, there were no introductions. Hey, how are you? Where are you from? Oh, you're from Galilee. That makes you a Jew. And that didn't happen. She looked at him and heard him say something and then knew he was a Jew. So it's either they're dressed differently. I mean, sort of like different subcultures, even in our country, dress differently. And you can kind of tell a little bit. In addition, uh, Jesus may have had a different dialect. The Galileans may have spoke Hebrew differently than the Samaritans did. That happens in America. We speak different dialects of the same American English. And so you can kind of tell based on accent, you know, where somebody's from. She could tell immediately by what started off this conversation that he was a Jew and she was a Samaritan and she was a woman. Rabbis didn't usually teach women. Jesus was uh, rare in that respect. Um, so, and then it, you know, and then it explains her surprise. And we've talked about this for uh, a minute already, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So Matt, can you reread for me? his response to her in verse 10. Sure. Jesus answered her, 
If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Gift of God. What is this gift of God? I would think it's salvation, ultimately. It's a good answer. If you knew the gift of God, and salvation is the whole reason Jesus came to earth as a man, to die on the cross, to die for sins, to make restitution for that, and to, to redeem for himself a people to God, to save sinners. That was the whole reason for him coming. He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, he says, if you knew my identity, if you knew that I was the Messiah, if you knew that I was the Savior, you would ask me for a drink, and I would give you living water. This phrase, living water, uh, throws her for a loop. And that's because, you know, to us, uh, if you've studied these passages before, and, and you may have heard or, or maybe even sang in songs about living water, you probably automatically associate this phrase with salvation, with the, the blessings of the Spirit, um, with the outpouring of the Spirit. But she would hear this phrase, living water, and this is in, in, in a p opposition to dead water. Well, they called spring water that's moving and clean. They called that living water. Dead water was stagnant. Dead water is what's down here at the bottom of this well. It's stagnant. And I don't know if you've ever drank well water, but it tastes like well water. Does not taste like spring water. Now, I'm not talking about sulfur springs because those taste nasty, like rotten eggs, okay? But, except I hear they're good for healing. But the point is that she hears living water, and what is she thinking in her head? Is she thinking something supernatural or spiritual? No. She's thinking spring water. Oh, wait a minute. It, you're telling me you've got access to better water than this? And so that kind of gives us a clue as to why she responds the way that she does in verse 11. Alyssa, reread for us verses 11 and 12. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Good. So it's clear she's thinking about physical water, actual water. And if you, could, if you say, I'll, I'll give you living water, she goes, well, wait a minute. To me, that means spring water. And I, I live here, and I know I can look around. This is the only source of water here. That's why I came here to get water. If there was a spring, I'd have been there getting water. But I came here. So she goes, maybe you have access to take this spring water up from somewhere. Are you greater than our father Jacob? Do you know who dug this well? This is the father Jacob that is the father of this whole nation, and he dug this well. And so, so she's, she's confused by his offer, you know, uh, and she's not thinking in a spiritual or a supernatural sense. So Jesus just continues. He's, he's, not, um, he's not put off by that. He just continues. In verse 13, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water, meaning the well that they're standing next to, will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. That's how it reads like in English. In the Greek, that word there will never be, is written, will never be thirsty. I'll write it down here. Never be thirsty. In the Greek, it says forever. Like you could imagine, even in the context of one lifetime, you could say, never thirst again. Well, that's probably until you die. In the Greek, it read literally, never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So here he says, look, this water is temporal. And he's trying to explain to her the water I'm talking about is not temporal. It's eternal. It's spiritual and it is eternal. 
It is something that will sustain you and it will sustain you in such a way that it will give you a new life, eternal life, not just the life that you're trying to scrape by on right now. Well, she seems um, convinced because he's insistent that he has this kind of living water and will give to whomever asks. So the woman says to him in verse 15, sir, give me this water. But she still doesn't quite get what he's talking about. Because how does she couch the request? Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. She's thinking, he must have magic water. Not spiritual water, not, not using water as a picture to paint spiritual truths. She's thinking, this is magic water. I'll never have to draw water again. I won't have to come out to this well again in the heat of the day alone. Why would she not want to do that? We're about to find out. So she's still thinking temporal water, magic water, not spiritual water. So in verse 16, Jesus takes a different approach. He pulls a hard left on her. Matt, can you reread for us verses 16 and 17? Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. Do you want me to stop there or finish the... So I'm sorry, read to the end of 18. Okay. You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Good. He says, go and call your husband. He's now pushing the conversation into a personal zone because he knows something about her that she does not know that he knows about her. And she answers and says, I have no husband. Now that's a truthful answer, but it's not a complete answer. How many husbands has she had? Five. Five husbands. I'm going to draw them all up here. Let's see. One, two, three, four, five. She's had five husbands. Now, the Bible does not say what happened to these five husbands. Then there's this one over here that she's living with that's not her husband. Now, in that day and age, it was customary for husbands to dismiss their wives with a written certificate of divorce for any reason. Any, all they had to do was write down one thing about them that displeased them. And she didn't make a good breakfast today. You know, I, I, I don't like the way she's been dressing lately. I mean, it, it really didn't take much. So is it possible that she's just been the victim here? Yes. However, that doesn't answer all the questions we have about the situation. For example, she's already living with another guy that she's not married to. Okay. So that brings to mind the possibility that she got divorced from these other five men. They divorced her because of her unfaithfulness. There's also a sign that she's a social outcast as a result. She has come to the well. By the way, there's a reason why they call it gathering by the water hole, the watering hole, that it's common for humans to gather around these sources of water, these resources. It's a social aspect. Women, uh, part of their job of running the household was going and drawing the water needed for cooking and cleaning and other things. They would do that in the cool of the day because carrying water is heavy work. So they would go with their friends in the morning to go get water. And then they would go with their friends in the evening to get water. And it's a social activity. But here she is alone with Jesus in the heat of the day. And she doesn't really like coming to get water because there's other people there that don't like her. She's a social outcast, likely because of her lifestyle. So, and, and, and I want to, I want to point that out because Jesus has pushed this into a personal zone so that she will understand her own sin. The, the goal here in this conversation is this gift of God that he's talking about. It's to give her that water that he's promising. And that's salvation. The goal of this conversation, this is a gospel conversation is what we might call this. This is a witnessing opportunity. This is a testimony to the gospel of Christ. And there's something that we need to remember when we're talking to other people about Jesus. 
Nobody is going to be saved unless they are first lost. You don't know what you need rescuing from until you realize that you're in danger. You don't need salvation from sin until you believe that you are a sinner. You, you don't uh, need to be justified and made right with God until you understand that you are under his wrath. So he's pushed this conversation into a personal zone so that she will admit that she's living in a life of sin, and she's currently doing it. I have no husband is true, but it doesn't actually describe the sin that she's living in. Well, she's not really happy with where this conversation is going. And I, I don't know if you've ever witnessed to somebody before um, who, who rejected it. I have before. It's not uncommon when you start to bring up ideas like sin and all that for somebody to either say, uh, you know what, we're done here. I don't want to talk about this right now. Or they'll say, you know, you're being really harsh, man. I'm not really that bad. I mean, people are really good at heart. Or they'll do what she does. They don't want to look like they don't know what they're talking about. They're talking to somebody about spiritual things, but we don't want to talk about my sin anymore, so let's change the subject. That's what she does. She says to him, sir, in verse 19, sir, I believe, I perceive that you are a prophet. In other words, there's things about you that nobody could have told you. I've never met you. I know you don't live here. I know everybody that lives here. But you know this intimate history about my love life and the failure thereof. Clearly, this has been revealed to you, so I perceive that you are a prophet. Consequently, let's talk about something deep and theological, and we're going to make sure it's controversial, so we stick on it for a little while. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and remember, she's pointing up at Mount Gerizim that's right there next to Sychar uh, on the map. She's pointing up there. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say, she's meaning because you're a Jew, you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. So she, she wants to talk about something theological, um, theologically controversial. And I, I've got a good example of this. I, I heard somebody tell, and it is a joke, and I'm bad at jokes, so y'all just bear with me. Um, I heard somebody tell a joke where there was a man who was a Christian, and he went to his friend to teach him the gospel, to tell him about Jesus. And the man said, look, I, I get what you're trying to do, but you just got to understand, I can't, I don't believe the Bible is true. And, and his friend said, well, why, why not? And he said, but there's just so many things that, that don't make sense in the Bible. And he says, well, give me an example of it, right? And notice he's changing the conversation. He's trying to get to something controversial. He says, well, you know that guy Cain in the, in the Old Testament? He killed his brother Abel, and then he was, he was banished, right? But then it says that he married somebody, and he founded a whole city. Who was his wife? Because like it's nobody else was created yet, right? So who was his wife? And his friend said, yeah, I, I get what you're trying to do here, but I got to tell you, you would not be the first person who missed out on heaven because he was worried about somebody else's wife. Okay? That's what she's doing here. She's saying, look, I don't want to talk about this sin. Well, let's talk about something else. I'm going to talk about why I don't think the Bible is true. I'm going to talk about why I don't think your religion is true. I'm going to talk about... You know, let's get out of the sin stuff and talk about something that we can agree to disagree on. And then we can part friends. That's what she's trying to do. Well, Jesus, Jesus doesn't let up. He says, okay, let's talk about that. You want to talk about where we're going to worship? In verse 21, I'll tell you what, who read last? I think I read last. So, Alyssa, it's your turn. Alyssa, can you read Jesus' response, verses 21 through 24? Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in the Spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Good. Um, he, he addresses her head-on in this controversy. 
He says, look, you're worried about where you're going to worship. Let's just talk about worship for a second. He says, God is spirit. God does not live in one temple or the other. He is spirit. His spirit is infinite. It's everywhere. God is omnipresent. And it is, it is so high that any worship that we have, number one, is not going to meet what he's worthy of. But at our very best, what we need to be doing when we worship him is to worship in spirit and in truth. Now, he uses a few phrases here that I want to pick up on. He says, salvation is from the Jews. Salvation is from the Jews. Well, first of all, Jesus was born a Jew. His ministry was to the Jews. Ultimately, the intent, the purpose, and what was accomplished was that it spread to the Gentiles. But it was first to the Jews. So that's point one. Second, he says, you worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know. Remember, the Samaritans only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, as scripture. The rest they rejected as canon. And um, the Jews accepted the full counsel of Old Testament scripture. He says, there's things about worship that you're not getting because you're not reading and understanding the scriptures that have been given to you. So um, those are some things that I, I, I want to pick up on here. And she responds with a let's agree to disagree answer. In other words, I wanted to pick a fight about location. You want to pick a fight about mode and means, and I don't know what you're talking about with spirit and truth. But I tell you what, one thing we can agree on is that there's this guy named Messiah. In verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. In other words, there's this man coming, the Messiah. Who remembers what the word Messiah means in Hebrew? Sorry if there's a law order, if that's too loud for y'all. Y'all just let me know. <laughs> Audible, but not too loud. Okay. Uh, anointed one? It means anointed. Very good. That's also what the word Christ means in Greek. It's the same word. It means anointed. And what three roles were, were rolled up in the expectation of the anointed one? What three offices? He would be a prophet, priest, and a king. Prophet, priest, and king. And Jesus fulfilled all of these roles. Prophet, priest, and king. These were all offices wherein you were anointed when you took the office. Your head was anointed with oil when you were chosen by God to be a prophet, when you were uh, initiated as a priest in the service of the temple, or when you became king of Israel, your head was anointed with oil. And so when you see the word Messiah, we've got to be thinking those three things. Well, she is, she's almost, she's almost uh, giving a, what's the right word, um, a concession here in the argument, because the Samaritans would not have known very much about the Messiah. Much of the Messianic prophecy in the Old Testament is outside of the Pentateuch. There are some things in the Pentateuch included, but you know, you've got all the description about the new covenant in some of the prophets. You've got the uh, promised king of, uh, in the line of David that's included in some of the, the historical uh, portions of the Old Testament. Um, there are Messianic Psalms. They don't accept Psalms as canon. Well, she's going, but... We know that the Messiah is coming. She knows the Jews going to agree on that. And when he comes, he'll tell us all things. In other words, you're trying to pick a fight about my sin. I, I, let's fight about something else. And then you want to talk about spirit and truth. And I tell you what, there's going to be a guy who comes eventually, and he's going to tell us all things. We can all agree to disagree on that, and, and we can just finish. And he throws a bombshell at her. And that's where we're going to wrap up today. Because we're going to, the, the fallout of that is going to last until the end of the chapter. Well, until, until verse 45. That's not the end of the chapter. She says the Messiah is coming. And what does he say in response to that, Matt? I who speak to you am he. 
I am he. I am the Messiah. Now, other people in the Gospel of John have called him the Messiah. They've called him the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. But this is the first time in the Gospel of John that Jesus comes out with his own words and says, I am the Messiah, the Christ. Now, notice who's here in the frame. Are his disciples here when he makes this claim? Nope. Is his mama here? Nope. Uh, are there kings of Israel here? Are, are, are there Roman leaders here? Uh, it, is there a news crew here to tell the world the Messiah has come? No. It's him and a socially outcast, probably unfaithful wife who's had five husbands and now is just living with another man. That's it. It's just the two of them. And he shares that knowledge with her. And we'll see next week, she takes that and runs with it for joy. Because the thing she was so ashamed of and didn't want to talk about a minute ago, she knows that she is going to be saved from. Their conversation will continue. And we don't really see him address her with any specific words as the conversation continues, but the disciples are going to return and just find him continuing to talk to her. And we can imagine that she's going to go, wait, what? Are you serious? And he's just going to unload on her. And it works because she believes in him. And we're, I mean, I could just, I could talk about this for the rest of the day, but we're not, we're going to talk about it next week. So you got to come back next week and we'll, we'll keep studying that. But one last point that I want to make here is that when Jesus um, approaches her, A, he goes out of her way, out of his way, to make this happen. Somebody from McKinney, Texas is calling me. I don't know anybody there. Um, he goes out of his way to speak to this one person in a land that Jews normally don't even walk through if they can help it. But two, the, the means by which he went about getting at this conclusion was very simple. He didn't memorize a presentation. He didn't walk up with a, an Avanja cube or anything like that. He didn't even get out a Bible. Okay. Now, yes, he's Jesus. He could probably pull all this off better than we can anyway. But the point I want to make here is that he went from give me a drink to let me tell you about the Savior in some very short steps, that he took an opportunity here to take a temporal problem and turn it into a spiritual conversation. And this is something that you and I can do. Uh, when we talk to other people about Jesus, it doesn't have to be a, a rote presentation. It doesn't have to be a, a hurried push kind of thing. Um, it can be a, man, isn't that a beautiful sunset? I tell you what, when I look at that, you know what that tells me? Is that there's a God that exists, and he loves to make beautiful things to glorify himself. What do you think about that? Right? What do you think about that? And, and holding a baby in your arms and letting it wrap its little fingers around you and, and see the design and the beauty there. Well, and here, he, he, all he did was say, can you give me a drink? And turns it into a word picture with water and living water and salvation and then he gets to the problem of sin. And you and I can do that. And think back at times when you may have had opportunities to do this. You know, uh, are, are there simple opportunities in your everyday life where you don't have to push for a hard sell? Sometimes, um, I read a book once called Tactics, and it was a tactics in sharing your faith um, in Christ with other people. And one of the first points he makes in the book is that um, and, and we're going to talk about this some more next week, is that some of us sow the word, but it's not accepted. And then somebody else comes along and does a little gardening. They water in the soil. And then later, sometimes even a long time from then, somebody else comes along and says, hey, have you heard about Jesus? And they reap the harvest. And none of them get 
the credit because God did all the increase, but sometimes you're going to be in situations that are very simple and you're just going to do a little gardening in somebody's life. And, and that's good too. So we'll talk about that some more next week as well. I've also read that book and, and just before you started saying that, I was going to bring up that point. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, it, it just fits so perfectly. And that's the, actually like one of the main things that stuck with me in that book is um, don't put so much pressure on yourself when you're talking to someone about Christ that they should right then and there get this look on their face and change their lives in that one very moment because that may not happen. But what you're doing is planting a little seed or like you said, doing a little gardening, doing a little bit of watering, and you don't know who has gone before you to do the same thing and who's gonna come after you. Um, so, and I think that's so important because oftentimes we can talk ourselves out of, I may as, I may as well not get into this conversation with this person because I, I don't think it's gonna go well, but that's, mm -hmm. not, that's not the point. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's a great book. It's good, it's good. Now Matt's gonna wanna go, go read it because of peer pressure. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> it's good there's uh and this so this has nothing to do with the lesson but the one of the tactics mentioned in the book is the colombo method wherein you don't really present anything to them you just keep asking them questions and you ask them more questions and the longer you ask somebody to clarify their position on what they believe if it's not founded on truth at some point it's going to fall down and they're going to go you know what? I never really thought about that. And then you can say, well, can I answer that question according to the Bible? And now they're kind of like, well, yeah, I guess so. Cause, cause what I thought was true can't be true. So that's, that's the Columbo method. He does a good job describing it. And my wife and I have been watching Columbo the first time we're like, we're in season two and it's just like he described in the book. I was so, I was like, wow, this show is so good. That's exactly, that's all he does. He keeps asking, he keeps scratching his head like this and going, you know, there's just, there's just one thing I just don't get about what you said. I was listening and it doesn't make sense to me and it's going to keep me up all night. So can you just clarify a little bit for me? And that's exactly how he is on the show. Except really I watch it and she sleeps through it because she's uh, pregnant and it's the end of the day and the episodes are like an hour half each one is that long so she just falls asleep but it is a good show so any other thoughts or questions i thought it was interesting uh, along the lines of what the samaritans ought to know or did know accepting only the, the pentateuch where there's pictures even in the Pentateuch of living water referencing the the rock that Moses struck uh, with water that came out and um, uh, saved the Israelites on, on the exodus there when they're in the desert mm -hmm. which is a picture of Jesus and yet you know if you're just reading that it's like you were saying you wouldn't if you didn't have the the following context and prophecies and psalms describing pointing out that hey that was a picture, just that little incident that was recorded, which you just think, oh, it's a miracle that God didn't, oh, and Moses disobeyed and struck the rock. That's mm -hmm. actually pointing to Jesus too. And yet you, you wouldn't see that unless you, you know, had that additional context and your heart was changed to, to see it. But mm -hmm. it wasn't like the living water was a, a, a made up new image. You know, it was something that people should have recognized. It's like, oh, hold on. Yep. Very cool. Well, um, I'm going to tell y'all, thank y'all for coming. I'm going to stop the recording and then ask if there's anything that you want for, um, for me to be praying out this, about this week for us to be praying about. But I want to say thank you. Um, and if you're watching this recording over the next week, then you should come next week so that you can join in and, um, I can heckle you in person. So, I'll hit stop now. Thanks.